this morning, you and I are going to become very intimate friends. I'm going to get naked with you. Mm -hmm. But first, I'd like to show you a picture. Now, I'm sure this is not the picture you were expecting. But the truth is, I really love stories. I love pictures. Sometimes I spend hours poring over the minute details to find stolen glances, hidden meaning, things that ordinarily escape our attention. Take, for instance, the little girl at the center of this photo, and then study the faces of those around her. For the most part, they are looking at the camera. But she, she's multitasking, she's blowing a balloon. Her mind is somewhere in the distance, oblivious to the camera. That little girl is me. I'm five years old, and I have recently arrived in Antigua. The other children are displaced Dominicans, and let's set the record straight. Contrary to what you may have heard, we did not arrive on the banana boat. We all flew in on Liat. <laughs> now, stories are like the blueprints that explain the completed architecture of our lives. My story is not unique, but that is precisely why it is worth sharing. In one way or another, we are all displaced. You may have had to leave your family, your home, or your country because of economic, social, or political reasons. And oftentimes, the decision, one which may not have been yours to begin with, creates psychological and emotional effects that remain unseen and rarely discussed. So, since I'm bearing it all for you today, I should tell you who I am. I am the result of two totally different families, two distinctly different cultures, and two islands. I'm sometimes like the little girl you saw earlier on that photo, searching, curious, distracted by visions in my mind's eye. But of course, nothing is that simple, and neither is my story. So let's start at the beginning. The day is August 29th, 1979. David was not supposed to visit Dominica. He was supposed to visit Barbados. But instead, Hurricane David turned around and proceeded to smash Dominica to bits. When it was all over, about six hours later, all the leaves had left all the trees. Schools, crops, homes, everything that was anything was totally destroyed. And three quarters of the population was now homeless. A constant reminder. Now, luckily, I was not among the homeless, but my mother was a teacher, and my father was a farmer. So what do you think were my options? Well, stay with me. I'm going to try and make sure you understand. I come from a long line of teachers and police officers. In those days, constant movement was a feature of the Leeward Islands Police Force. My grandfather served in the Leeward Islands Police Force. And that time, you would have had the creation of many pseudo-families throughout the islands, if you know what I mean. So as a result, my mother was my grandfather's contribution to the population of Dominica. Now, as it turned out, my cousin Bridget was returning home to Antigua after having heart surgery in Trinidad. According to her, on a whim, she decided to stop over in Dominica to grasp the extent of the damage. Well, upon her return to Antigua, things were put in motion so quickly that within a short space of time, along with 30 other Dominican children, including both of my brothers, I arrived in Antigua. Now, honestly, I consider it the luck of the draw. 
being born female actually paid off for a change. You see, Bridget had four sons, and so she decided to keep me as her daughter. Now, life in Antigua was something totally different to me. There were organized moments, and I don't know how I knew, but I just knew that as that little girl, I had two mummies, two daddies, six brothers, and I still somehow felt alone, but there was an organized cadence. There was high school, brownies, girl guides, church, confirmation classes, music lessons, Sunday afternoon excursions. On the surface, life was great, but that's because I became adept at hiding my occasional discomfort as questions about meaning and my place in the world persisted. Take, for instance, the time when my daddy, who was the Minister of Education at the time, came to my all-girls school to present an address. I was excited. Picture it, there I am, shoulder to shoulder with my fellow students, excited that daddy was about to address my school. Throughout his presentation, my sons, my sons were weaved in and out. And me, I was excited because I was waiting. And I waited. And I waited. And then it dawned on me that my daughter did not feature in any of these stories. For a long time, this reinforced the dis in my placement. All I remember is how I felt. It also planted the seed for my understanding of gender in life and society. On the surface, life was great. Now, going to Dominica was a different thing altogether. Things of importance just landed on you, boom, and you had to find a way to deal with it. So it was that I was 15, just about to enter fourth form, and with no forewarning, no time to tell my friends, no time to even get used to the idea, I was informed that due to daddy's cancer, I would now continue and end my high school education at the convent high school in Dominica. My mothers, my Antiguan mommy and my Dominican mother, they were the catalyst for the type of woman I would later become. They were highly driven, organized individuals, and my Dominican mother, she was like a drill sergeant, an educator for most of her life. She would write rules and regulations throughout the entire house. And as a result, there were things like, please remember to flush, written in the bathroom. My Antiguan mommy, on the other hand, she would dispense sage advice verbally and vocally. I can just hear her now. If you're going to do something, do it properly or not at all. So returning to Dominica, despite all of this woman power behind me, still I was left with a feeling of internal discomfort. In the first few months of my time in Dominica, I had an unpleasant and embarrassing return. Nightly bathroom visits. The truth is that your body often reveals the ailments of the mind, and it was like being five again. I continued to get smaller, well, obviously, not in size, but in the way I carried myself around my schoolmates and my extended community. You see, coming from 108 square miles of flat land to 238 square miles of rugged and mountainous terrain, this was not something that I could do traveling from my parents' home in Portsmouth to school in Roseau. I could not stomach this daily. As a result, life in Dominica continued this way, with me getting smaller. Now, getting reacquainted with Dominica was something that opened up a whole new world. Culture, nature, national pride, these things came alive for me in a way like never before. I embraced the Creole heritage and my Kalinago roots. I learned to become an explorer. 
It was also in Dominica that I discovered my suitability for radio and where I had my first real job. Dominica also allowed me to embrace not fitting in. In my university years and in the years following, this was where I was able to find perspective because distance creates perspective. And so being able to look back at the seemingly disjointed parts of my story allowed me to create positive meaning. Now, I must tell you that we need to pause here for a moment because there's something I need to confess to you. I had great difficulty trying to figure out how to tell this story. There were some parts of the story that revealed a level of internal shame and guilt for me. And I thought that you would perceive me as cold, heartless, and the most dreaded of words, ungrateful. I was concerned about stories like the ones I'm about to tell you now. I believe that life and death are inextricably linked. Take, for instance, a, b a birth shortly after a family death. Wherever there's life, there is death. Wherever there's death, there is life. Sometimes that life is a rebirth. I experienced a rebirth in April 2012, as I observed my mother pacing what some of you know as death's door. In our family, we call it the departure lounge. It happened over the course of a week. First, there was that moment in my mother's room. The door is closed and there are people shuffling around on the outside. This is the first time that me, my mother, my mother and my brothers are together like this. There are two beds in the room, and my brothers are sitting closer to my mother. I am sitting on the bed furthest from her as she is drifting in and out of worlds. They are caressing her arms lovingly. And I'm present, but just barely. I'm observing this scene and realizing something does not fit. I do not fit. I'm neither moved to join in this display nor ashamed by my lack of participation. I mean, here I was, my mother's only daughter, and she her mother's only child, yet, the distance I felt to her at this moment was larger than the oceans that separated the two countries. Days later, I again experienced that feeling of being present, but just as an onlooker. This time, after a hurried summons to the hospital in Roseau, where she now was, I was aware that she was about to board her flight. I was about to become an orphan. And like the little girl that you saw blowing the balloon, simultaneously, two thought streams were activated. On the one hand, there was the sadness at witnessing this pivotal moment, and my tears began to flow. I wondered, how had I performed as a daughter? On the other hand, there were thoughts about her as a woman, as a person. I wondered, did she live life the way she wanted to live it? Did she have more joy or more pain? Did she have regrets? Were there things that were left unsaid and undone? Were there dangerous liaisons and great adventures? Did she... And then she exhaled. I have a story. You have a story. We all have a story. How you interpret your story is entirely up to you. I can now admit that for more than 25 years, I lived on the sidelines of my own life, scared and in hiding. I was afraid to offend and af afraid to displease. 
In the days, weeks, and months following my mother's death, this was the catalyst for my transformation, I went on a new journey. My 15-year media career presented a choice between maintaining a safe paycheck or rocking the boat. I decided to rock the boat. It was a choice I could live with, and it also meant the closure of that aspect of my life. So here we are now. I have been able to release guilt and shame for things that were totally outside of my sphere of control. I'm also living a deliberate life. I have chosen to pursue life as an entrepreneur. And this also means that I've chosen to embrace my preference for working with women and also to embrace my desire to want to transform lives through speaking. Now, it has not been an easy journey. There are times when I ask myself, Marcella, what the hell are you doing? And during those times, I refer to the words of my Antiguan mommy, who, on relaying the news of my Dominican father's death during my second year of university, said to me, none of us come to stay. I take those words as a reminder every day to live life so as to not have to look back with regret, to be here now, and to look forward with anticipation for every little thing and every next thing that leads to my idea of happiness, that leads to my growth and embraces my love for freedom. Here we are. By now, since I have allowed you to peek behind my curtain, that means we are BFFs now. We're best friends forever best friends, and what I can tell you is that it is not easy to get naked with yourself, but there are benefits. And so, here's what I suggest. You may need some liquid courage. You may need a pen and a journal, and of course, you're going to need that mirror so that you can look at yourself. Once you've got those things, all you have to do is take it all off. Thank you.